Hello, Ajax, and welcome to Ajax Council presents a live Q&A for businesses with our local MPP and Minister of Finance, Rod Phillips. So thank you again to everyone who's joining us online on Facebook right now uh, for this great Q&A and chat uh, with Minister Phillips. Uh, if you do have questions, please ask them uh, below in the comments section. Again, this whole theme of our uh, live conversation today is around uh, local businesses and supports for businesses uh, during COVID-19. Uh, we've got several questions that were pre-submitted um, in advance of the Q&A, uh, so we'll get started with those momentarily. So first, I'd just like to say that Ajax Council organized this event to connect our local businesses directly with Minister Phillips. It really is an opportunity that Council wanted to have made available for our local businesses to hear directly from the province. So I'd just like to recognize all members of Council who are tuning in. Mayor Sean Collier, Regional Councillor for Ward 1, Marilyn Crawford, Local Councillor for Ward 1, Rob Tyler Morin, Regional Councillor for Ward 2, Sterling Lee, Local Councillor for Ward uh, 2, Ashmead Khan, Regional Councillor for Ward 3, Joanne Dyes, and Local Councillor for Ward 3, Lisa Bauer. Um, and a special thank you to Regional Councillor Marilyn Crawford for leading the coordination of this event on behalf of Ajax Council. So again, this is a, a great opportunity and a forum to connect directly with Minister Phillips. Uh, we are using technology here uh, to, uh, to connect with all of you. So if there is any issues during the live stream and we get uh, disconnected, please just stay on and stay tuned because our team will be working behind the scenes to get us all back up and running. So I'd now just like to welcome uh, Minister of Finance, our local MPP, uh, Rod Phillips, uh, who is joining us today directly from his office. Hi, uh, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Hello, everybody. And uh, thanks, uh, as you said, to Ajax Council for the work that all of you are doing in terms of maintaining the connections uh, and uh, and getting people's questions answered. Special thanks to, to Regional Councillor Marilyn Crawford. Marilyn suggested about uh, 10 days ago, she said uh, something like this would be a great idea. I, as, as Minister of Finance, I get an opportunity to do a number of interactive sessions. I've become a little bit of a, a Zoom or whatever variety of formats we have uh, expert on terms of how we uh, how to, to interact this way. Of course, it's unusual normally as, as uh, politicians we get a chance to meet with people in person. Uh, not so much the way it is these days because of uh, because of obviously the important uh, uh, necessity for social distancing. So anyway, thanks, Marilyn, for suggesting this. Thanks to Rachel for hosting and thanks to Council for putting it on. And I look forward to uh, to getting over to the questions. So, uh, Rachel, I know there's a few lined up, so I'll uh, I will uh, look forward to the questions and uh, and uh, maybe have a chance at the end just to say a few parting remarks. Thank you very much. Okay, let's get started. So we've had several questions about the province's framework for reopening. So stage one states that select workplaces that can immediately meet or modify operations to meet public health guidance and occupational health and safety requirements can open. How are these workplaces selected? What criteria is used and how can businesses and industries communicate to the province how they will meet slash modify their operations to meet the criteria? Great question. Just a recap for anybody who isn't aware, about a month ago, we laid out a framework that had uh, this idea of three stages uh, of moving back to, to an open economy. And the idea was that those stages would be stage one, stage two, stage three, with a three to four week time frame between each stage uh, while we opened up to make sure that we were managing the public health uh, and safety requirements as we gradually reopen the economy. So last week, we were able to move to the first stage. And again, for those who may not have had a chance to uh, to pay as much attention to it, uh, retail uh, businesses that are not in shopping malls but have an outside door uh, are able to open, again, with limitations in terms of the number of people in, inside and having to uh, make sure that they uh, enforce social distancing. Construction 
uh, the remaining parts of construction were brought back online. Again, very important to keep that part of, of our economy moving, uh, but done again within the public health requirements. Uh, people would have heard it was quite publicly about the golf courses and marinas and some of those things, a number of outdoor activities and some indoor non-team so, uh, sporting uh, activities, but those that were not um, required with an audience. So, so people being able to, or, or, or spectators. So there's a wide range. It's all available at Ontario's at their website. Rachel, we might be able to put that up at some point just so people can see what that is. Um, but the, the, the idea was that these were uh, businesses that based on the experience of the province and our public health officials, especially during the essential service point, uh, per, uh, period, we were able to determine how they could operate. So we did a lot of work when we had our grocery stores and pharmacies, the LCBOs as well open um, to learn from their experience about what needed to be done in terms of physical distancing, in terms of personal protective equipment, or at least shields for some employees, in terms of cleaning and, uh, and doing regular cleaning in terms of uh, the facilities. All of that information has been made available to business um, through our Ministry of Labor. So on the Ontario.ca website, it's Ontario.ca forward slash COVID, um, you can see the actual Ministry of Labor guidelines, 95 of them. So every one of the businesses that is now in a position to open has a specific set of Ministry of Labor guidelines. There are also guidelines that have been produced there for some of the businesses that haven't yet been able to open. So for example, personal service businesses, things like uh, hair salons, uh, nail salons, um, other types of businesses, restaurants. So that information is now being made available so that those businesses that may be part of phase two or may be part of phase three can start to become prepared and look at what the expectations will be for that kind of opening. Thank you. Um, further, further to the uh, province's framework, uh, stage two says that more workplaces can open based on risk assessments. Who is conducting these risk assessments and what are the criteria? How will decisions be made and tracked so that they are applied fairly and consistently to all businesses and industries? I got a great, great question. And one of the great challenges of both how we had to shut down the economy and how we have to open it up has been this issue of, of fairness. And you know, one of the areas that's come up with, uh, with local merchants for me has been certain businesses were allowed to operate because they had, for instance, grocery inside of them. Well, other businesses may not have had grocery and, and couldn't operate. And of course, that's because we were in that essential phase when we had to make sure people could get food. Um, and, and it was, in some senses, um, not really fair because they also had other things to sell at that time. So, so there is a challenge from a fairness perspective, inevitably, because of course, we never imagined we'd have to either shut down or open up the economy. But the question is very specifically, how is this done? So in phase one, in phase two, and is phase three, there's a process that starts with an assessment looking at the public health uh, implications of certain types of businesses. Um, if I go to one, I could talk about, uh, let's say, large scale events. Uh, so let's say um, major events with 10,000 people at them. Clearly, that would be very difficult in smaller spaces, especially interior spaces at a time like this. So, so there are just clear public health priorities that relate to what we understand from a health and science perspective about COVID. Also goes through our Ministry of Labor. So Monty McNaughton, who is a Minister of Labor, has been extended consulting extensively, particularly with the safety associations that work for various industries. But we've also been gathering feedback directly. And again, at the same um, web location uh, portal that I mentioned, people could go and you can provide that feedback directly from different businesses. Um, I've set up through the Jobs and Recovery Committee that the Premier asked me to chair, stakeholder panels. There's been 27 of those set up where various industries, whether it's small businesses or other industries, the agriculture sector, the mining sector, uh, all manner of industries have been able to provide feedback back through my ministerial colleagues to say, what are the actual things within our industry so that we can understand, you know, what are the criteria that you're thinking about? At the end of the day, the choice that we've made is that we are providing guidelines. So I mentioned that there's over 90 of those guidelines on the Ministry of Labor um, website. Those are guidelines. We know and we trust that local businesses, businesses across the province are going to behave in a responsible way especially with the contract tracing uh, that we're doing. No business wants to be the source of a COVID outbreak. That's not good for business. That's not good for their employees, not good for, for customers. So we are trusting that businesses will look at those guidelines, um, look at them closely, and then make sure that they're operating within them. 
Now, of course, like any other workplace, there is enforcement. Uh, we've had over 7,000 inspections uh, since the outbreak began, um, and that's because the Ministry of Labor has expanded its, exp its inspection capacity. Uh, that could be construction sites, that could be different types of locations. Often that comes because employees have indicated that they have some concern about a workplace. So very important that businesses work with their employees, look at those guidelines, make sure that they're comfortable uh, working in those environments. And of course, that's going to work for everybody because it's also going to make it comfortable for customers, which at the end of the day is everybody's uh, priority. Rachel, and there's really two things that we know and we've looked extensively at other jurisdictions that have opened up already. One of the advantages of Ontario being at the time we are in this is we've been able to watch jurisdictions around the world open up. And we know that there's two things that have happened everywhere around the world. The first is when economies start to open back up, no matter how careful they are, and we're being very careful from a health perspective, but no matter how careful they are, there is going to be some increases in cases. This happens because of course, COVID-19 is still with us. So when people start to get together again, there will start to be these interactions and there will lead to some cases. So we need to be in a position to make sure that we're able to manage those flare ups. That's why we're so uh, focused on things like testing and tracing on hospital capacity and those things. The second thing that has happened around the world, no matter where you look is, Fewer people have shown up, fewer businesses have decided to reopen than people thought, fewer employees have come back than people might have thought, and fewer customers at least initially have come back. And we have to be prepared for that because people are still concerned about the reality of COVID-19, the effect on them and their families. So that is just another reason why business owners and all of us have to be very uh, disciplined about making sure that we're enforcing social distancing, we're providing hand sanitizer, where appropriate, we're using PPE or other barriers. We're learning all these rules because we want our employees and we want our, uh, our customers to feel comfortable coming back. And that won't just be for phase one, that'll be for phase two and for phase three as well. Thank you. Um, and I'd just like to say we've got over 90 uh, people joining us right now live watching the live stream. So thank you to everyone who's joining us. I'd also like to mention that we are live right now on Rogers TV Durham. So hello to everybody who's watching us from uh, their television sets from the comfort of their home. Um, and again, if you are on social media and you have questions or comments for uh, Minister Phillips, please use hashtag live with Rod Phillips and we will ensure that uh, we're monitoring for your questions. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, Minister Phillips for uh, answering that last question. Um, still in the same vein around the province's framework, uh, when will the province publish a more detailed framework document that outlines which industries and activities will be considered for opening and at each stage? So we published, a, and again, if we check the, um, and we should just make sure we have the website, if we could, the specific web portal. So I'll give you, I'll make sure. But if you go to the Ontario.ca forward slash COVID portal, um, there's a very detailed listing of the businesses that are available to be open right now. Um, and there's, remember, there were also a number of businesses and industries that weren't closed down that were maintained as essential services throughout. Uh, but we'll continue to provide a comprehensive list. There's also a uh, toll-free telephone number as well as a web chat capacity to call in and check if people have any questions. So we've provided a lot of opportunities for people to find out you know, which businesses are included. The stage two opening is, of course, going to be subject to the same criteria that we laid out over a month ago. We need to see that cases are going down in a steady fashion. We need to make sure that we are maintaining hospital capacity. Uh, and that's a very local issue. So in Ajax Pickering and through Lake Ridge, we need to make sure that whole system is maintaining capacity. And we're doing that across the province because we're maintaining that capacity because remember, as I said, there will be some inevitable spikes as people uh, come back and are, are seeing each other more. We need to make sure that there's room in the hospitals to take care of those people. We also need to make sure that we're maintaining our contact tracing and our, and our testing. On contact tracing, the standard we've set is we want to be able to identify 90% of the people from any specific uh, COVID outbreak with Within 24 hours. And then we have a fourth criteria around making sure that we're protecting uh, our more vulnerable populations. But all of that framework has been laid out um, pretty consistently uh, for over a month ago when we laid out that, that roadmap. Um, and then as we bring new businesses into line, and the next opportunity for that will be likely in a couple of weeks, uh, when uh, hopefully, and again, it's all dependent on all of our success in terms of being able to uh, you know, keep those cases going down, maintain the hospital capacity and otherwise, then we will announce another round of the, of the next layer of businesses um, and then we'll proceed through there. Rachel, if I can, I just, here's the full, um, the full uh, 
web address is ontario.ca forward slash page forward slash reopening dash Ontario dash stages. So that'll get you right to the specific. But basically, if you go to ontario.ca, you can find all of this information. Excellent. We'll make sure that we add that link to the uh, the comments section of the live feed on Facebook right now. So thank you very much. Um, the next question um, is still in respect to the uh, reopening strategy. Um, so we understand that there are 90 guidelines for businesses uh, to further help businesses determine what is required to purchase and implement. Is there a list of what is absolute required versus guidelines? Um, is there a common minimum requirement that all businesses must comply with? So, so what you what you have in those ninety five lists are the the guidelines. And again, we have a view that we have to trust our business owners and operators to make sure that they look to those guidelines very seriously. And they would expect that were, whether it was public health or any bylaw officers who are coming to to look at them, they would be looking to see compliance with those guidelines. The major reason, though, if you want to go from a legal perspective, the Occupational Health and Safety Act requires that employers provide a safe workplace. And so there are numerous uh, fines and other penalties that employers are very well aware of when it comes to why they need to manage a safe workplace. So, so again, employers are responsible people. They have a vested interest in making sure that their workplaces are operated in a safe fashion. Employees have taken this very seriously, and you know we've we've expanded the the capacity on our on our phone lines in terms of people calling in. And you know we have had a number. I believe there's about 40 actual orders that have been issued. I mentioned all those inspections, but there's been a number of orders issued as well where inspectors have gone as a result of often a reach out from an employee and said, you know this is not you know, meeting the threshold of a safe workplace. But at the end of the day, the reason we've gotten to the point we've gotten to, and, and I should say, Rachel, you know, 14 and a half million Ontarians and certainly everybody in Durham and Ajax, the vast majority of people have done a great job of getting us to where we've gotten to, to where we've managed to flatten the curve of, of the growth of this. We've gotten there together because we've worked together. We're going to have to continue to do that. And we're going to have to continue to trust and rely on people to do that. And obviously there's enforcement um, if people are not uh, are not living by the rules. Thank you. And that's actually a really great segue into the next question. So for businesses, how do they know they are being compliant? Um, how is enforcement going to work? And are there any penalties or even incentives for businesses? Um, well, there's absolutely, as I said, in starting with the, the penalties, the, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, it can be over a million dollar fine just in the most extreme cases. Um, but there's both there's both um, significant fines and then smaller $750 or $1,000 fines. So a full range of enforcement mechanisms that either bylaw officers or, or labor inspectors can use if they find employers to be in violation. Uh, again, I would point to those guidelines, unlike other provinces, we did a very thorough job uh, working with the industrial safety associations, working with public health to provide those guidelines. Uh, for example, curbside pickup was one of the areas that a number of businesses decided to operate under. There are 14 separate guidelines for how a business can safely operate for curbside pickup. Now, the difference between if you are a, you know, a big uh, Home Depot and what you might need to do. And if you are a small or a bookstore and you decide to operate with curbside pickup, you can understand how some of those 14 may apply differently to you. And we you know, expect that employers need to work with their employees and in the cases where they have unions to work with their unions to make sure that they're operating safely. But that is the source of information for them. And then there is uh, the toll-free helpline for any employer who wants to call and say, I'd like to understand this. Um, there's also some very useful uh, online tools. Uh, we've gotten, for example, case studies. One of the things we did very early with the LCBO, because uh, as folks likely know, the Ontario government owns the LCBO. It actually reports up into the Ministry of Finance. So I spoke to the CEO of the LCBO about eight weeks ago, and I said, you operate large retail stores, medium-sized retail stores, small stores, rural, urban. You have warehousing, you have transportation, please keep track of all the things that you're doing so that we can actually um, use those as case studies for people if they are more interested in finding out what works and what doesn't work. So there's a lot of information through us, through the Chambers of Commerce, both the Ajax Pickering, but also the Ontario Chamber. There's a lot of good information available and, and frankly, forums where people can have these kinds of conversations and learn from each other. So as I said, we'll figure it out together, but those guidelines on the Ministry of Labor website, again, available through Ontario.ca are the best place to start in terms of the specific guidelines for your business. 
Thank you. And I can confirm we have shared that link in the comments section below on our Facebook live feed. Um, and as well, uh, that information is available in the business section of the Ajax.ca website. Um, so we're moving on to another question. And this is from our downtown Ajax BIA. Uh, many businesses are struggling just to pay rent and keep their space. Um, are there any grants, uh, not loans, uh, for small or micro businesses to get uh, that require PPE? Um, not at this time. Uh, what we have done is provided a, a site specific for PPE. Um, first of all, there's the, the guidelines about how to use it, but also at the Ontario.ca site, there is a site where people can access PPE uh, providers. So there have been a number of domestic providers that have started to produce PPE, including in the Durham region um, and outside of that. And then there's places where people can purchase it. So we have provided locations where people can get access to it. Um, and again, I think look to the guidelines and look to the specific businesses uh, as to how what's the proper use of PPE. I know in a number of cases, for example, uh, people have used plexiglass as uh, you know for their cashiers. And that is another way of trying to manage the cost of having to have fresh PPE because there's a protection because of the plexiglass. Glass. So again, I don't want to give specific recommendations. I'd rather people look at the uh, at the website, but but all of those options are laid out, including places where businesses can purchase and access various levels of uh, personal protective equipment. Thank you. So I've had a uh, question come in uh, from Councillor Crawford, uh, who has been hearing a lot from our, our local businesses. Um, so our, the question is, how far in advance will businesses find out um, that they will be allowed to open, um, and how will they be notified? Um, and how far in advance would they receive any guidelines um, in regards to health and safety? So the, so the guide, great questions. Thank you, Marilyn. So in terms of the guidelines, uh, we will make sure the guidelines are available for the businesses that are available to open. But again, the guidelines, there's many guidelines today for some of the businesses that uh, aren't yet in the category of stage one, so aren't yet ready to open. So I would check that website out because there's a pretty good chance there's already guidelines there for you. Last time, what we did is we announced on a Thursday, and I think the opening was on a Tuesday. So, so we provided sort of that length of time for, for businesses to be aware. Remember that we aren't working off of a set schedule. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 virus doesn't work on our timelines. Uh, we need to make sure that those public health criteria are in place. So we'll make sure that there's at least four to five days where people can be made aware of the fact that their businesses are, are likely going to be able to be open. That's what we did in stage one. Um, but in the meantime, a lot of work can be done uh, by businesses. And I know I was speaking on the weekend to a number of local businesses uh, in Ajax, including some of them in the, the downtown BIA, um, about their preparations. And they, they've you know gone online and they've looked at the guidelines and they've, in some cases, acquired some, some masks, for example, because they think that's one of the things they're going to want to have. Or they've gone into their stores and put in some of the stickers we've all seen in some of the places as far as the physical distancing. So there's nothing to stop people from doing that work now. Um, and we'll make sure that at least that you know, five, six days in advance, the guidelines are available that people also know about the opening. So just in addition to the guidelines, um, is there any assistance available to help train businesses in implementing the required health and safety measures? Again, um, the, uh, the the best source for that is likely to go and uh, to the toll-free number. But I have to say there have been a number of initiatives offered through the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, which I know the Ajax Pickering Board is associated with and others, um, to provide uh, you know places where people can get um, that uh, that additional guidance. Um, we're going to be we are going to be in this for a while, and we are going to continue to learn. And so there are also a number of different tools and online tools that I have to say uh, people have sent me and I've, I've seen some pretty good YouTube uh, information. But as far as what the government's providing, um, we're essentially directing people to their various business groups uh, to say, you know, if there's a specific area, sometimes the industry associations, uh, the Ontario uh, Restaurant Association, for example, just to take one example, um, have you know, been in the, in the business more providing training and support for their members. Um, so again, a num if you are in a particular um, industry or business, I'd suggest you look at your industry association or to the chambers. You know, they are, you know, trying to be as helpful as they can and supportive as they can and understanding that, that um, although specific uh, nuances might change. Uh, the rules around physical distancing, around the various things that we have to do, um, those are starting to become pretty established. So, uh, you know, we're all going to get very good at this by the by the end, I suspect. 
Thank you. Um, so Councillor uh, Sterling Lee has a question um, and he's been hearing from local businesses as well. Uh, what can businesses do if a landlord doesn't apply for rent relief? You know, Councillor Lee, that's a good question. Uh, and the program, there's a federal uh, provincial partner program. And, and I do like to, uh, you know, I think the provincial government's been doing quite a bit. Um, our federal government has also been doing a great deal to support uh, specifically businesses as well as individuals. Um, but, uh, but with their uh, payroll support programs and the uh, loan and forgivable loan program that they've been rolling out. Uh, but one of the other programs that we have partnered with them on um, is a program for rent relief that uh, the Councillor Lee's uh, uh, talking about. And I'll just give a little bit of background on that because everybody might not know about it. Um, what we've offered through landlords is the opportunity for landlords to apply through Canada Mortgage and Housing for what in effect would be um, a payment of 75% of the rent for COVID affected businesses for three month period. And the tenant in that case would be responsible for paying 25%. Uh, the province and federal government together would pay 50%. And then the landlord would take a 25% reduction of, of the gross rent. Uh, this is a program that just was launched today. It was talked about about a month ago and the federal government has now rolled it out across all the provinces with the support of all the provinces. It's over a billion dollars in support um, for tenants and landlords. And so I'm very much encouraging people to go to either our website or the Canada Mortgage and Housing uh, website to access that program. Tomorrow it's going to open up just for smaller um, uh, landlords and then it'll be opening up over time for the larger landlords. Um, the question that Sterling is, is asking is, well, what happens if a, if a landlord isn't uh, taking advantage of that program? We, of course, hope that landlords will. Um, we think that given the challenges that everybody is facing, the opportunity for landlords for the, and this is just for businesses that have had a significant effect from COVID. Um, the fact that, that uh, the government is willing to subsidize half the rent um, is, is a good deal. And we're very much encouraging landlords to take advantage of that. Obviously, they have to look at the program. It just became available today. So, so you know, we have to give them the chance to do that. And I, and I think that when they look at it, uh, they're going to see the value in doing that. Of course, by doing that, they're very much supporting their tenants. What I like to say to landlords is the tenants you've had for the last five years are most likely to be the tenants you're going to have for the next five. Uh, quite frankly, given the challenging economy, I'm not sure there's going to be a big lineup of new tenants to, to fill uh, that empty space. So um, so I'd very much uh, recommend that uh, that landlords take advantage of the program. Of course, tenants should make sure that they inquire with their landlords about it, but appreciate that from the landlord's perspective, that program just became live today and this week. So it'll take some time for them to look at it. Thank you. And uh, I'd just like to mention that our economic development team here in Ajax is listening to this in, in entire conversation and to this feed. And, uh, you know, they really are uh, have the pulse on what's happening locally here in Ajax and what different resources and supports that are available for businesses. So I do want to encourage our local businesses that are tuning in and, and listening right now to uh, email priority at ajax.ca with any uh, questions you may have. And our economic development team is happy to uh, connect you with resources and supports. And we will uh, we will share that email address in the comment section of the Facebook Live. Um, so we're just going to move on to, um, to another uh, question. And again, it's around PPE. Um, and it's uh, this is a question we've received from a local business. When I open my storefront on June 1st, can I make it mandatory for my customers to wear masks? Is it legal to make this mandatory? You know, it's a, it's a it's a one of the questions that these are the sorts of questions that we're all being asked to uh, to to look into. Um, from I'll tell you from uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I won't I won't give legal advice. Uh, you know, certainly on Rogers and and on and on the webcast. But but I think all of us have an obligation to protect the health of our employees where we have employees and the health of our customers and health and safety of our customers. And so um, if, a, if a store owner believes that that's the best mode of operation, uh, then, then I think they should want both and customers and, and employees uh, to work in that way. And the expectation is that we, we do that, that we, we look after um, each other in that way. Um, I, I have to tell you a story, uh, Rachel. I was very affected. You know, I, I must admit, I've been wearing a mask when I've been sort of in places where I couldn't control my physical distancing. But I was talking to, to one of... Uh, one of our uh, fellow Ajaxians uh, the other day, and and she really put a point on it for me. She was talking about how when she 
is at the Sobeys, and she has a she has a child who has um, a pre-existing uh, condition that could make that child susceptible to COVID. And she said, when she's going through the aisle, she said, I can, she can appreciate why some people don't want to wear a mask. It's not that comfortable, and you know maybe they're younger or whatever reason they don't feel like they're likely to be affected. But she said something to me that I'll never forget. She said, when I see someone coming the other way at the Sobeys with their cart and they don't have a mask on, I see someone who could be a potential killer. And it was really a stark way to think of it because none of us would think of ourselves that way. But from her point of view, her fear, of course, is becoming infected with COVID and then taking that home to uh, to her child. Right? And so uh, that had a, I guess we all have to think not just about ourselves, um, but about the effect on others, about particularly the effects on our most vulnerable populations out there, whether that's seniors or others, um, and know that we don't know so much about COVID to know who any of us might be vulnerable. And so I think it really comes down to a matter of personal responsibility. And to get back to the question, I think if a, if a store owner believes that that's the level of responsibility they want to have in their store, then they should absolutely encourage not, not just themselves and their staff, but others to, to, wear, to wear masks. And then that will get into the question, which was asked before, about needing to pay for it. Right? I think if you're if someone's coming into your store to buy something and you want them to to do something, uh, then then there's a, there's might become an obligation back on you if you want those customers to come in to provide it. So these are all the new things that we're dealing with in the in the COVID uh, world, and uh, you know I'm sure we'll figure them out together. But there's no easy answers. Thank thank you very much uh, for for your answers to those questions. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of uh, the live, uh, we received many questions in advance from our local businesses. So I'm just going to move to a question uh, from Angie, who owns a, a local uh, transportation service for for children here in, in Ajax. Um, so this is her her question. So she owns a transportation service for children and seniors, um, and she wants to know um, since she's been shut down since March break. Um, her question is in regards to day camps opening up for the summer. Will there be any changes or regulations for the transportation aspects of these camps? Um, for example, in September, when schools reopen, how will requirements for transportation services change? Yeah, Angie, it's a great um, it's a great question, and one of the things that Stephen Lecce, who's our Minister of Education, is working on. Um, we did announce last week that, subject again to continued progress from a health perspective, we are going to look at opening up day camps. That was not not overnight camp, but day camps, and and obviously just for parents and families who want to take advantage of that. That is going to involve some different rules uh, around what would have traditionally been thought of as day camp. Similarly, Minister Lecce talked about in stage two, which I talked about. Could be two to three weeks away. Um, we will be looking at what we will do with regards to childcare. Uh, obviously, we know that childcare is an essential uh, component of work for many, many families. And we've been operating a number of emergency child cares under some revised uh, circumstances. So for front care, we've wanted to provide free child care for our frontline workers. Um, and so we've been learning about how to how to operate those child care operations in this COVID environment. So all of that, another facet of that is going to include transportation. Um, whether it's by by bus or in other ways, and what are the rules uh, going to be required around that? So, so Minister Lecce has been working on that. They, those those guidelines are not out now, nor are the nor are the day camp guidelines. The reason the announcement was made about day camp is because there's a lead time that the day camps needed to know whether or not they were even going to be open or not. Of course, this was at the same time. I'm not sure anybody would have missed it, but we also announced that schools won't be reopening till at the end of the year. So we wanted to, to have all those together. So Angie, there will be guidelines on those. Um, I'll tell you, I'm going to give you my, my constituency office phone number just so you have it. We're operating remotely, but anybody as well who has any feedback on these sorts of things or ideas, uh, these are things that very much are helpful. And so I know that people who provide these services are people who will have insights specifically into how um, we might want to operate. And you probably will be able to use the most creativity about how to do that because you know your business. So if I can, just so people have the number, uh, my office is 905-427-2060. So that's 427-2060. And then the web or the email address, if that's more convenient for people, is rod.phillipsco at pc.ola.org. So those are two um, and I'll say that again, rod.phillipsco at pc.ola.org. But, but Angie, if anybody else has suggestions, I mean, there are, there is a, there is a portal through the website I talked about to provide those suggestions directly into the ministries involved. But also if anybody would like to provide that kind of feedback, we'd welcome it because, you know, we, we're all going this through this through the first time. We're all trying to do the best job we can, whether it's federally, provincially or locally to, uh, to be as flexible as we can while we maintain safety. 
Thank you very much. And uh, we made sure that we had your contact information available on screen and we will share it again in the uh, comments section of uh, the Facebook chat as well, uh, just so that uh, local constituents, businesses, residents, organizations uh, can connect directly with you at your office. Uh, so the next question we're going to go to is from Kevin, who is a local property manager. Um, and his question is, would the province consider matching the emergency wage subsidy and providing 75% rent relief uh, to companies? Are there any options for landlords to assist tenants? I, I'm, I'm not, uh, can you, do you mind repeating? I just want to make sure I'm properly hearing Kevin's yeah. suggestion. Who wants a 75% yeah, no wage subsidy? Uh, so, so Kevin, I'll, give you, I'll give you a, a, a bit of background on uh, Kevin's comments here. Um, so uh, many small commercial landlords after expenses make about three to four percent return on their buildings. Asking them to rebate their tenants 25 percent puts the landlord in a lost position, which if they can afford it, will take them about three years to get to uh, break even. Um, they can, cannot afford this, so they are offering tenants the option to defer rent. My question is, would the province consider matching the emergency wage subsidy and providing 75% rent relief to these companies? Are there other options for landlords to assist tenants? So I think what, I think what, not the wage subsidy, but the rent subsidy, probably means the rent subsidy, I'm just thinking. Is yes. That, uh, yeah. So, um, so, you know, the program we put forward, unless I, I've had a number of conversations with landlords, some larger ones, certainly some smaller ones. Um, this is a temporary measure. This is, we're talking about a three month period. And I certainly appreciate that we're asking landlords to, to take that 25% reduction. Um, as we are asking tenants to pay 25%. And then, of course, the, the federal and provincial government's making up the other 50%. Uh, you know, I would, imagine each business will have to look at it in its own light but this is the program that we think is fair and i don't think that there should be an assumption that there's going to be another program if landlords don't take this and i and i think landlords need to look at i guess a, a, a three-month window where frankly we're asking them to you know reduce the rent for the businesses that are going to be there versus their other options uh some landlords i know and and i don't think it's widespread but some have talked about evicting their tenants and and obviously if they do that uh there's two risks uh, the one risk is that they are going to not have anybody to replace that tenant. And we're, again, talking about a three-month period. Um, the other, of course, is that, you know, other actions will have to be taken to make that, make that uh, to protect tenants. And that, that won't help or support uh, landlords in the wrong run who are running businesses themselves. So, you know, this is not a perfect situation. Remember, all of this, the root of all of this is a global worldwide pandemic. Uh, we are facing uh, the most difficult economy, certainly that has happened um, in my lifetime and, and in most of our lifetimes. Um, and I think the idea of all of us having to try to compromise a little bit uh, makes a lot of sense. And so I appreciate the suggestions from Kevin, but I think I think landlords should look very seriously at the program that's now available. Um, and and again, understand that they're running a business, so are their tenants. And, uh, and you know, at the end of the day, as the premier said, uh, we, we will do what we need to do to protect tenants, but there are, there are currently 1.2 million leases in Ontario. So the idea that something you know specifically for tenants would be it's quite a difficult program to roll out because there's also a matter of time in this regard okay thank you very much for uh for answering that question um the next question is from tanil who's a local solopreneur here in ajax um so they are an owner operator out of ajax um, a sole proprietor um, and has not been eligible for any support that has been issued uh so far uh, she'd like to know, can you please advise if any financial relief is available for the short term to assist small businesses with their monthly um, expenses? Uh, she's contacted uh, the government of Ontario and they just referred her back to the local municipality. So just wondering if there's any good supports we could point her towards. Sure. So, so Tanel, I think I gave out my number 905-427-2060. For anybody specifically, it might be easier for you just to contact uh, my office. On the, without knowing the exact details of your business, it's hard to know which programs you might be available for. I have to say, and I give credit to the federal government uh, here and our local MP, uh, Mark Holland, and what the work that they've done. They've done a great deal to adjust the programs over time uh, to make them more flexible. So there's a program, for example, for a loan uh, of up to 40000 that has a $10,000 um, uh sort of a forgivable portion uh, that was originally uh, set up in a way that made it difficult for sole proprietors to apply, but has been since adjusted. 
There were a number of other supports, including uh, the CERB program that originally the way it was structured made it a bit difficult for people. And, and so through feedback that we've been able to provide, and I know others have been able to provide, a lot of those programs have been modified since they were originally introduced. So you know, if you call my office, we'd be happy to walk you through all that to make sure that the existing programs that are out there, um, that you have the most current version of those, and hopefully one of those will be able to, uh, able to help out. Thank you. Uh, so our next question is in regards to uh, to restaurants. Um, will Ontario be mirroring Alberta's limit of 50% capacity and physical distancing? And this was a question from local councillor Rob Tyler Morin. Yeah, great, great question, uh, Rob, and thanks for joining today. We are looking, um, I guess, one of the benefits of going a bit slower, and, and we have taken a, an approach, you know, in Alberta, um, very much having a different experience in terms of overall um, the COVID uh, infections. And so they're a little bit ahead of us and there's other places a little bit ahead of us. Uh, we've been watching how these work. So um, we don't have the specific requirements set out yet for restaurants. And that's partly because we're taking advantage of learning from these other jurisdictions in terms of what works and what doesn't. Now, when I say what works and what doesn't, first and foremost, it has to work from a health um, and safety perspective. But of course, we also want to make sure it can work from a business perspective. So one of the suggestions that was putting for, put forward by uh, one of my colleagues, Ela Marlowe, who's our member from Thornhill, was the expansion of patio spaces, which you know intuitively makes a fair bit of sense and would involve partnering with our municipal partners. But we know that outdoors is better than indoors with regards to, uh, to infection. Um, and there may well be some things to do in that regard. And that's something that she got from another jurisdiction. So, Rob, no decisions are made yet. Those will obviously be posted well ahead of time so that restaurants will be able to organize themselves. But we are watching what works, first and foremost, to make sure it's safe, uh, but also so that we can do our very best so that the restaurants uh, and bars and other places, as they open, have a chance to, to be successful. It's, it's part of how we, uh, you know, we, as you know, we've amended some of the rules for takeout to allow the delivery of alcohol and other things. These were amendments we made based on feedback we got uh, from people saying, you know, this is the sort of thing that they're doing elsewhere. Why can't we do it in Ontario? And the answer was we can't. Right? So we're going to try to do everything we can to make those businesses successful. But we got to make sure, first and foremost, that they're safe. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so I have another question here from uh, Councillor Lisa Bauer, our local councillor for Ward 3. Um, some businesses don't actually meet requirements for loans. Example, they're in business less than a year. Um, what sort of help would be available for those types of businesses? Now, Lisa, again, it's the, the also I can say, and without going through all of the criteria of all of the programs that the federal and provincial government put in place is, both governments have been quite flexible about trying to adjust their, their criteria. You talk about the loan criteria. One of the challenges was um, history and the fact of having enough history for the, the loan to be viable. So, so again, I'll, the only thing I could say, and again, anybody specifically, I'd refer them uh, to, uh, please give my office a call. We'd be happy to walk you through the programs. Um, but there have been a number of adjustments made to try to make those uh, programs more flexible. Obviously, when you're talking about programs that have to be available for, you know, tens and tens of thousands of businesses across not just Ontario, but, but Canada. Um, some of those programs, are, there are going to be cases where, where businesses aren't eligible. Um, but I think certainly the provincial government, the federal government, and also the local governments with regards to, for instance, things like deferring property tax and other things have tried to be as flexible as possible. But yes, the reality is there will be some businesses and some individuals in some areas that aren't eligible for some programs because um, because it's very, very difficult to have programs that are comprehensive for you know all of the hundreds of thousands of businesses across the country. Thank you. Um, I think uh, you know everyone is uh, really starting to think about um, hair salons too right now. Um, and uh, I have a question here from Karen. Karen, so would hair salons that are already set up for one-on-one -on -one, uh, be able to open first with added protection in place? Um, I understand that salons that have many people at one time need more time to open, but just wondering for those that are set up for more of a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, what the timing would be for that. Yeah, great, great question. So, so um, the first opportunity for that would be in that phase two that I talked about. And one of the things that we always say to businesses is, 
just because you can open doesn't mean you have to. So I would imagine it'll depend on the preparation that is done, but that some some businesses are going to be able to open more quickly once they are able to, um, just because their physical setup will be more conducive to that, or because they've done the preparatory work now, and maybe they're they're doing the work now to put in place. You know, maybe it's only every other chair. I'm not an expert in hair salons, but you know the the different sorts of things that they they would want to do. Um, so so that opportunity would first come in what we'd call the the second stage sorry i called it a phase the second stage um we're in that first stage now we just have to make sure the cases keep keep going in the right direction um and then uh, and then i think you know businesses will have to make sure they're putting the protections in place and um, you may well be right it might be easier uh, for some of the smaller operations to get themselves in that situation more quickly than others and again the guidelines that's a case where the guidelines are very important to look at and and i'd recommend to anybody uh with that uh, either those kind of personal service businesses we think of nail salons a variety of other types of businesses to try to be looking now to see what uh, what those rules are so they can get prepared for it. Help help get their staff prepared as well, where, where you have a situation where you have multiple staff. Thank you. Um, and I just had a follow-up question from Mayor Collier, and it was just in regards to uh, camps that you are speaking to earlier. Um, so from Mayor Collier, when stages two and three occur and more programming is allowed, will municipalities have flexibility and choice around what programs and services reopen and when? Uh, for example, day camps. Yes, and Mayor Collier has made the point, and I and I absolutely I am a big fan of the mayor. Um, he's uh, got some concerns around day camps. I know in the city of Toronto, for example, they've made a decision, not simply from a health perspective, but also just from an operating perspective, uh, that at this stage uh, they may change their mind. But at this stage, they're not going to be providing day camps. Um, at the end of the day, we have want our municipal partners to be important, uh, an important uh, partner in this. Uh, you know, we're not going to force anybody uh, to have to open services. I mentioned about businesses. Businesses, you know, for example, retail businesses have been available under the restrictions I talked about if they're not in a mall and have an outside door to open as of last Tuesday. But, but some have chosen not to either because from a business point of view it doesn't make sense or because they haven't got the preparations in place so we're going to want to make sure that anybody who's responsible for operating uh whether it's a recreation uh program or a business or something else uh that they have the guidelines in place that they're opening in the stage that we say we should but also that they feel comfortable because if if we don't feel comfortable as the operator of something um, we're not going to be very successful at making our employees and others uh, feel comfortable in that so so i'm sure uh, working with the town and and with the uh, region of durham and and with municipalities generally we'll have lots of discussions about what makes sense um, we are saying some things definitively for instance with regard to camps we're saying there can't be overnight camps and that's again because our medical advisors and science advisors our chief medical officers said they don't believe that that's a safe environment so we are saying no to certain things and that's just based on the health reality that we're facing uh, but we are going to work with with partners and again nobody should open a business or an operation if they don't feel they can do it safely thank you um, so the uh, next questions i have are from our ajax economic development team so the town is part of the Durham Economic Task Force and has recently completed its third survey of businesses regarding their ability to reopen. An interesting statistic is the anticipated timing for businesses to recover. In the first sur survey, early on in the pandemic, 69% of businesses thought they could recover in less than six months. The third survey, um, which just closed uh, this week, reveals that 50%, uh, 56% of businesses now feel it will take them six to 12 months to recover and get back to pre-COVID business, perhaps suggesting that businesses are less optimistic and have lower confidence in the economy rebounding quickly. So two questions for you. Uh, the first question, how is the province preparing to support businesses for the next 18 months? What is the long-term plan for supporting businesses and employees? Um, and what support will the province provide to the municipalities to support the employers and get people back to work? So I've been a part of a number of the meetings. Chair Henry brought together this, uh, this group. I think it was a great idea right out of the gate, uh, again, showing great leadership. Um, we are now, we've talked about three different phases of, of this uh, 
COVID experience. Uh, the reaction phase was really just responding to the health reality on the ground. That involved closing down the economy. We're now in the second phase, which is reopening, which we've spent a lot talking about stage one, stage two, stage three. Uh, what, one of the things we're consulting on now, and the premier asked me to chair our jobs and recovery task force in this regard, was looking at the recovery and what is going to be uh, necessary. So I've, uh, we've set up a committee with uh, about 12 of my cabinet colleagues. We've asked all of our MPPs and not just the ones from the government, but also opposition MPPs to conduct broad-based consultations. Uh, we are looking now to see what is going to be required uh, for the recovery and how long do we think that that recovery phase is going to be. Uh, quite frankly, nobody knows right now because we are still in the midst of this very difficult uh, economic situation and I think we are all learning as we go. Uh, but the one thing I can promise you is whether it's with our local governments or ourselves as a province or with our with our federal partners, um, all of the governments are going to continue to work together to try to support um, the recovery, not just of our businesses, but of our, our communities in general. So, so we've set up a very extensive consultation process. We're gathering that feedback as we speak. There's 27 ministerial advisory committees representing every sector of the economy. Um, we're also working with other sectors, not just the economic sectors, but some of the other sectors that are highly important, working on issues. We talked about some of them today, childcare, education, looking at transit, transportation. What does the future of that uh, look like? All of these things uh, brought together uh, that will be finally the, the overall strategy we have around recovery. Right now, we're in that re reopening stage. Um, I should say that when uh, back, uh, seems like a long time ago, but back in March, our plan was originally to bring a budget forward, which would have been a typical government budget for with a five-year forecast. Um, we pivoted because we realized that COVID was having a big impact. And unlike any other government in Canada, um, I brought forward a very concise one-year strategy that basically laid out a bunch of investments, $17 billion of direct and indirect support for businesses. I've talked about some of that today, but also an economic plan that really was just for a year. That's because, quite frankly, in March and April and even in May today of 2020, one, you cannot, you cannot, you can, 2020, you cannot see um, clearly how the economy is going to unfold. We're going to have to do that together. That's why we're doing this broad-based consultation. And, you know, the Durham Economic Task Force is going to be an important part of that. Again, I commend myself to all the mayors, to the chair, and to all the participants who've been involved in that. Uh, Durham has always been, uh, been very good at reacting and responding. I think there is going to be opportunity in this, but um, you know, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't uh, look past the fact that we are in a very difficult economic situation, not particularly just in Ontario or Canada, but in North America and globally. And, uh, and we don't fully have a sense yet of the scope and scale of that. And we're all going to have to learn as we go, uh, whether it's about how we handle the various things we've talked about here locally, or how we respond to the changes that are going to happen uh, in our economy and in the world economy because of this. It's, uh, you know, we've got a fair bit of work ahead of us, but I'm, uh, I'm very confident that we're going to get through it. Thank you. And uh, another really important question that I know is on many people's minds is around childcare and daycare. Um, so can you speak to any programs or help for daycares um, coming back online as more people are going back to work? Sure. So as part of the a part of the reacting part to COVID, one of the things we did do is provide supports for daycare operators. Uh, we did not want that industry to to disappear because, of course, the absence of all of their uh, of their of their of the children in there. We, we needed those businesses to remain viable. And so Minister Lecce, Ministry of Education deals with that, provided some some of that more immediate support throughout the uh, this phase. We've been providing that emergency childcare for tens of thousands of frontline workers. So it, it, it's, uh, it seemed important to make sure that not just in our health sector, but in the other vital sectors where we're operating, that people could have access to childcare. Um, as part of the stage two, which as I talked about, will follow, uh, follow this, this stage we're in right now, uh, we'll be starting to address childcare. And I think one of the questions earlier was about what are the specific rules and requirements around that? Um, those will all be made, made uh, public so that operators can look to them. Um, as I said, first and foremost, particularly when it comes to our children, to make sure that they're safe. Um, but also uh, because we have to uh, make sure that those those businesses are going to be able to operate and be viable because we know that childcare is critical uh, to so many families, uh, both to you know, have their children in a safe place and also to let mom and dad um, go out and, uh, and earn a living. So, so that 
will be part of, a, of, the, of the second stage. And I expect is going to evolve over time, again, as we learn more about the reality of how we can operate in this COVID environment. And also, you know, as we get further, further into an open economy where there'll be more and more need for, uh, for childcare. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more final question before we get into uh, just sort of some closing remarks um, as we're right. kind of gonna, the just, for anybody who's, for anybody who's stuck around because I know it's it's been long. I'm going to I'm going to do a like <laughs> little special a special Ajax only uh, treat uh, in a moment. So there's a little, I'm going to I'm going to do a little tour of a, of a special part of the Minister of Finance's office. So just so you know, that's a little inducement to keep the crowd around for the last few minutes. Very exciting. I think Never you I think it, <laughs> I think in radio they call it a hook, so that's awesome. Thank oh, you very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so our final question: um, Will the province provide employers with the ability to do local COVID tested testing rather than the limited designated labs? So I'm so glad that that uh, that's a perfect day to ask that question. So just in the last uh, 24 hours, uh, we've expanded our testing. Uh, we are going to continue to do the great work that our public health units are doing, um, but we're also going to be doing testing um, more in the in the community, particularly focusing on at risk worst places. And so uh, the premier has been a real driver of this strategy. I have to say a person who's going to be familiar uh, to this group, Matt Anderson, everybody will remember Matt, he used to uh, run the Lake Ridge Hospital, he's now running Ontario Health. So he's been given the significant responsibility of looking at this expanded testing strategy. Um, and we'll be targeting particular workplaces, we did do, for example, a whole targeting of the long term care uh, sector where it was both uh, both residents and occupants, uh, but this is going to involve more testing in our in our health sector, but also in different business sectors because uh, because we know that expanded testing and continued ability to trace contacts is going to be an important part of the future. Now testing is evolving considerably. Today we're operating mostly with the same tests that we operated at the beginning of this, but some really exciting new testing capacity is coming online, uh, both from an antibody testing perspective, which will let us get more of a population perspective and also just more rapid tests that are RNA based including the Spartan based tests that uh, are coming out of Nepean in Ontario a great uh, great Canadian company a great Ontario company up there so this whole area of testing is going to evolve likely will evolve to involve more private labs although we've taken extensive use of private labs to up our testing capacity um, but but I think this is going to again be part of this new reality and again we're going to learn every day how to do it better and more effectively how to use different types of tests as they evolve so that we can uh, we can do a better job of making sure that we're not just identifying people with symptoms but uh, but those who are asymptomatic as well uh, which is clearly part of what we're learning about this is that uh, there are a number of people out there who are who have covid that don't know and uh, and if they don't know then that's very hard for them to to self isolate as they should so Rachel can I do the can I now do the hook sounds great okay come on with me everybody so so this um, so anyway, the Minister of Finance off. Oh, there we go. I've still got me. So one of the really cool things about this office is this building was built in 1964. So it has some old style things, including a, a little porch or a patio out here. So I don't know if you're going to be able to see. Tell me, Rachel, can you see? OK. Oh, yeah, we can see off the balcony. Yeah. So this is actually, if you can believe it, I'm lucky enough to get a balcony here in this office. And this is, was built back in the 60s when I guess these kind of offices had these kind of things. So so it's my favorite place to take people when uh, when they get to go out on a tour. So so what you're looking at is the corner of or the intersection of university and college. And that's the Mars Center over there. And that's what used to be the old Ontario Hydro building. And around the corner, no computer, but that's Queens Park around the corner. So so that's my little special. Uh, anybody who's a constituent who comes to visit me always gets to see the uh, gets to see the patio or the porch. So I just thought I would uh, I'd share it with everybody today just for uh, just for fun. No, I think everybody really appreciates appreciates that and the little behind the scenes tour. I had I, there's a joke a joke you know there's a because it's the Ministry of Finance we have an OPP de detachment downstairs and there's a little uh, joke that I, I like to tell it's true I used to go out on the on the whatever you call it there a porch or whatever uh, when I first started I just go outside to get some fresh air and the, one of the guards would say um, you know he said to me I didn't realize this said well you know this he said have you do you enjoy your your uh, your patio and I said oh I didn't even know you guys knew and they said well no we have an alarm every time you open the door an alarm goes off 
And I said, oh, like, I'm sorry. I, 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 he said, no, no, no. He said, it's, it's not that the alarm goes off. We just, you know, we want to make sure you come back in every time you go out. So, uh, so anyways, anybody who, uh, anybody, who, as we get the chance to get together again, um, we'll look forward to having the chance to see people in person and, uh, and show people around, uh, down here. It's pretty quiet as you can expect, uh, these days, but, uh, but you're, they're taxpayers' buildings and they're owned by everybody who's, uh, watching. So, uh, so hopefully, uh, some of my, uh, good Ajax constituents will get the chance to get the tour in person. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Minister Phillips, for joining us today and for, uh, you know, giving us a, an hour of your time to get through all these um, questions for uh, businesses. So before you sign off, just wondering if there's any final remarks you'd like to leave us with. Um, only this. Every chance that I get, I thank everybody, um, particularly in, in Ajax, because uh, you're all so important to me. But I say everybody um, in Durham, um, certainly everybody um, beyond that. Um, people have been really, really fantastic about uh, listening to the public health advice, uh, listening um, to uh, the requests that have been made on behalf of your government. I know it's difficult. I know particularly for smaller businesses uh, needing to be closed, now needing to think about all these things about reopening. Um, these are all challenges. Uh, the challenges we're gonna go through together, uh, but it's that work and that commitment that has made made us get to the success of, of doing better uh, when it comes to this outbreak. Um, I'm more optimistic every day uh, for three reasons. We are making great advances and our health professionals are making great advances in how they're supporting people and, and, and helping us avoid um, contracting COVID. So whether that's our public health folks or the folks at Ajax Pickering Hospital or in our long-term care homes, they're getting better every day. Um, I get to talk to some of the scientists and some of the researchers. We have some of the smartest people in the world here in Ontario, some of them working just across the street uh, at Mars and on, at these research facilities. They are learning new things every day that are going to help us beat this, either, either with a vaccine eventually, which we're hopeful for, but with antivirals and treatments in the short term. Uh, but finally, and most importantly, I get to talk to people every day, business people, uh, folks like ourselves who are learning how to live with these uh, new challenging times and figuring out better and better how to, how to make that work. So, so I think we're making progress on all fronts. We are certainly in for, for some challenging times because of COVID-19, but I'm so confident we're going to come through this together and come through it better. So Rachel, thanks so much for, to the town and to the members of council and to the mayor for, for putting this on. And uh, I, think, I think the town has done a great job. And I'm very proud of, of the town of Ajax and in terms of how it is, has, you know, used all these tools to try to help people um, get, uh, get through this and learn. And, and certainly I'm happy to be a part of that again, anytime you find useful. Thank you so much again uh, for your time today. We, we so appreciate it. And uh, a live recording of this will be made available uh, immediately following our live stream today. And uh, thank you once again for, for all your time. And we will do our best to get to all the questions we were, weren't able to get to over the hour. So thank you so much and have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you. So thank you again to everyone who joined us live today for our Facebook Live uh, for Businesses with uh, Minister Rod Phillips. Again, we thank you so much for your time today and uh, would just like to uh, promote our local economic development team and all of the different resources and supports that are available. So please stay connected with, um, with our economic development team through ajax.ca slash business, on Twitter at Ajax Biz Network. Give us a call. You can always email priority at ajax.ca and be sure to check out investorum.ca slash COVID response. Thank you, Ajax. Have a great afternoon.